from Numbers 11, 10 through 23. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put a burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant? To the land you promised on oath to their ancestors. Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry these people by myself. The burden is too heavy. If this is how you are going to treat me, please, Lord, go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes and do not let me face my own ruin. Moses is having a pity party, huh? Anybody else ever have a pity party? No? Anybody else feel the burden is too heavy and you can't save and help all these people? Yeah? All right. Well, let's see what happens. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and speak with you there. And I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. And you will not eat it just for one day or two days or five, ten, or twenty days. But the whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you. And wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? So here's another funny part. When Moses wails and says, the burden's too heavy to feed all these people. I cannot carry the burden. What does God do? He shares the burden. So it's not me, people. You get it. <laughs> so when you're like, what? What can we do to help save Sandpoint? There's a lot of hunger. There's, right, we've got stuff happening. Ah, it's not on me, people. It's coming to you. And I like to bring out the point about the meat. It's because if you've ever been really hungry, you've been walking vigorous in a desert, starving, you want something that fills your belly um, and lasts there for a while, and that's where the meat part. But what made God angry was, we've been over this, did the people as slaves in Egypt really eat meat every day? No. So they're essentially making up a false history of what happened in Egypt, and that's what makes God angry. But Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? So Moses doubts God. So fun times, you've got the people who believe a false lie about the past, and then you have the leader who is doubting God, right? So good times in the desert. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish of the sea were caught for them? Then the Lord answered Moses, Is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. Our Second Testament reading, we've been following in the book of Luke this year. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. So Jesus tells a joke. Nobody buys that. <laughs> so I think if I could read the language or from that time, we would have laughed. Like, okay, I'm asking for more faith, and you're saying I don't have any faith at all. And Jesus is saying it's not a quantity, it's not a physicality thing, it's something deeper. And then they want him to explain it more. And as we've been kind of learning through the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus has to repeat himself, he ups the ante, increases, right, the workload. And so he says, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep 
Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit to eat? So back then, in a time of heavy slavery, you could sell your children into slavery, you could conquer a land, turn it to slavery, all of this is legal, all of this is fine and dandy. Do you think those slaves would be joined with their master to share the same meal? No. So that's why we read about Moses, because those slaves did not eat meat every day. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along and sit with me? No. Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Jesus is talking to his disciples, so we've been talking about in Luke, you have to be careful when you read the Bible out of context. People will do it out of context. This is a discussion between Jesus and his disciples. This is a discussion Jesus is having with his disciples towards the end of the Luke. So we know we're getting close to the crucifixion. What's interesting about the disciples back then is you would say, I want to be a follower. I want to be like you, Jesus, right? So these are disciples who wanted to be like Jesus. And in their attempt to be like Jesus, they're not liking what's coming, right? They know the rumors. They know what's about to happen. They're not liking it. So then Jesus tells them a story. And he doesn't say it to encourage slavery or anything like that. He is talking to his disciples, people who asked to follow Jesus. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? No. Odds are, masters back then were quite cruel and would not thank him. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be God. Anybody know the term supererogatory acts? Anybody? No? Oh. Okay. In our Methodist book of discipline, a supererogatory act is somebody who doesn't just do their duty, but it goes above and beyond their duty. So an example of this might be, all right, let's see here. An example of this, it's a tricky fine line. People like to debate whether they were just doing their duty or whether they were doing a supererogatory act. For instance, um, if you're a bank and you're working at the bank, you're a teller at the bank, and your bank gets robbed and somebody comes in with a gun, most banks nowadays or they should anyway, they train their employees just to hand them the money, right? Maybe hit a loose buzzard, just do their job, right? Now, let's imagine you're a bank teller and you go above and beyond your duty <laughs> and they're going to take somebody captive, right? They're going to take somebody captive. And you decide that God is calling you to be the one they take captive. That everybody there gets to stay, and you'll be the one they take captive with a less chance of survival. So that person then went above and beyond their duty, right? Um, the Methodist Church, funny enough, in your book of discipline, now I know you guys love that book, but we technically do not believe in supererogatory acts. We don't. We think you either have the duty and you do it, and then that's that. And it stems from this scripture. You are just to do your duty. That it's not above and beyond. That there is no, there was this Christian, and then there was this better Christian. We get so used to comparing ourselves to other people. Recently it's come out, and there's been discussion about Mother Teresa, right? It's hard to think of a Christian who hasn't done as much as her for modern times. And what does she struggle with severely throughout her, her work? Depression. And so they've been talking about her journals and struggling with depression. And the Catholic Church, because they kind of like to hide things, um, they, they didn't want people talking about her depression. <laughs> because they want a saint to look all holier than thou, right? 
They want it to be like, oh, I did my duty, and God renewed my cup every day. Da-da-da. But that's not how it goes. It comes with pain. It comes with sacrifice. To love somebody means to literally be vulnerable enough and open enough that if we lose them, it will hurt. To watch them fail, it will hurt. It won't be easy. Even your beautiful story, right? Of John. It hurts, but it's so full of love. World communion is that for us today. It's it's gonna hurt. But it means we're vulnerable enough when we take our walls down that we care about everybody. That we don't become jaded or see the news and think there's nothing I can do. But it also means having balance. You are not to carry the whole burden yourself. You are invited into a community of people, a church family, to spread and share your burdens. You're not to suffer alone. That's not part of God's plan. Even on the night Jesus was crucified, he asked his friends to come to the Garden of Gethsemane and to pray with him, right? He was afraid that night. He didn't want to be alone. Now, did they disappoint him? Yes. Yeah, they fell asleep. We are spirits living a human experience. And as spiritual people... We need everyone. I thought it would be good to talk about what it means to be a Christian around the world. And I was praying to God because I didn't want to talk about me. I wanted to talk about somebody that is living in our world today that is trying to do the will of God, which is called upon her. And this story popped up. I know all of you have been reading your your United Methodist News vigorously, but um, in case you missed it, did you hear about the clergy woman who's on trial for murder? No? Oh, it's good. So there is this woman, and I wish I could say it better. At September 21st memorial service, marking the 50th anniversary of martial law in the Philippines, Bishop Sirocco Francisco the resident bishop of Manila area holds a sign supporting Reverend Golafi Baluntog, a Methodist pastor who has been charged with attempted murder in a case she and her supporters believe was invented to intimidate her. So she is a woman that has been serving against martial law in the Philippines. Now, martial law, does anybody know what martial law is, right? Chaos breaks loose, you enact a few laws, try and get the peace back. Is martial law supposed to be something that's in place for 50 years with a political party? No, no. So these people are being executed, they're being harmed. And this particular pastor who is in jail right now, she's a beautiful woman, I'll send the link this week. She has been under government scrutiny since 2019, and she has been working with the indigenous group on the island of Mindoro. She has stood with the Magayans in their fight to protect the environment and uphold their rights and also offered sanctuary to those fleeing violence. She's sort of known for using the church to hide and house people. Kind of like the way we did when we used the church to hide and house people, right? Coming up from the south. And so... (laughs) So the military government thought, well, well, how could we scandalize this pastor? How could we make her look bad? Well, clearly she's, she's a murderer. <laughs> so they make a false charge against her. And I could be wrong, and you guys could in two years come down and say, yeah, that was true. <laughs> Who knows? But that's what it means to be in Christian community. And so she's fighting for these people, and she's fighting for people with no voice, They're an indigenous group in the Philippines. They have no voice. She is a Methodist. She's an outsider. That's not the number one religion over there. She's fighting for these people. These gods call her these people. 
and now she's facing a trial for murder. Who else do we know faced a trial when they were innocent? Jesus, right? So I'll send this prayer and this woman out, and you can learn how to support her. But my call to you all this week as we pray for people around the world is, number one, to remember you don't carry this load yourself. We carry it in community. And number two, as a carriers of that community, we are to bless those who need us, right? We are blessed to be a blessing. She needs us. She's not going to get much attention. She won't be on the news. But she's our sister, and we love her. And like so many other Christians before, they came into the world to make it better. All these people. Those from hurricanes, those still without power, those in Ukraine, those in Russia. When the military takes over and peace is lost, it won't be the Prince of Peace we're serving. And yet, a remnant remains. Amen. Okay, we're going to have communion now. So if you take in your red hymnal, we as United Methodists, we offer open communion. You don't need to be um, baptized or belong to a certain denomination. It, communion is truly meant for those who long to be closer to God, and we offer no difference. So we're going to practice today, page 13, oh, sorry, 12, a service of word and table, number two, in your red hymnal. And those words that are bold in are your words. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law and we have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God, amen. Let us offer signs of peace and reconciliation to one another. So this is an opportunity for you to turn around and shake the hand of those in your, around you. You can hug, you can hand, whatever is most comfortable. You can fist or elbow bump. But you're to offer love to one another. Hug. <laughs> you still got your mic on. I know. Mm. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> As forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and mind, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the spirit and water. On the night in which he gave himself for himself, he took the bread. Give thanks to you. And then he broke the bread. And he said, take this and eat this. This is my body given for you. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said to his disciples, drink from this. All of you, this is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance and me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts through Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, God here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, which we know will come if we have the faith of a mustard seed and we feast in his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And with the confidence of children of God, let us recite the Lord's Prayer once again this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And we will serve us as us. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Okay, those who'd like to come forward. We're going to do it a little different. One second. Those who are able, we welcome you to come forward and receive communion. If you'd like to receive it in your seat, simply stay seated and raise your hand at the end and we'll come serve you. Come forward. Here, we'll sit over here. The body of Christ for you. Oh, sorry, the blood of Christ for you. blood of Christ for you, Jack. Yeah, let's switch. Blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you.
should be her. What a pressure for you. What a pressure for you. What a pressure for you. Shed for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Grain, which was once scattered over the fields, was brought together to feed us today. Grapes pulled from the vine, squeezed to give us drink today. Now our time of worship and feasting draws to a close. Now we are dispersed like that grain, off to give food of life to a hungry world. Now we who have shared the banquet of hope go out as people connected to the vine. Go out to bring the juice of life where the world has been drained dry. As people who have been fed, go now to feed the world. You can do it. You don't go alone. As those who have been given hope, bring hope in places of despair. May God help us to do so. May we be as brave as the Filipino pastor and always remember that we are never cut off from the source, the bread of life. Even from a jail cell, we belong to the true vine. And so we also share in hope's banquet, thanks to the one who hosts the banquet. Amen. Go in peace, my friends. Thank you.